No. No buzz. A Just Bees book club. Um, today is The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa. I just finished it today. Um, error writing has a particular effect on me that I think I'll get into a little bit later. Um, I guess I want to start with... Uh, there was one person, and since we're all bees here, um, I guess she just has to be B, um, who I thought about a lot while reading this book, and I'm very excited to give it to her, even though, um, I don't know if she'll read it or not, but, you know, her name is B. Oop. Oop. Unrelated shirt, definitely. Um, yeah, I, I hope she enjoys it. I hope that B enjoys this book. Um, I have read uh, One Other Thing by Yoko Ogawa, which I guess was actually an earlier book, but it was just translated recent, more recently. Um, it was on my best, I think it was on my best 10 of 2020 list, even though I later found out it was technically published in 2019. I just had not seen the hardcover. Um, I thought it just came out straight to paperback in 2020. But it is what it is. Um, that book is The Memory Police. Um, it's very good. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I also feel like I'm not sure it was on my top 10 because it feels like one of those books that might have been like a thing I ended up cutting because I just like really liked it and I didn't have a lot to say about it, which is, you know, top 10 lists. Um, Memory Police is about like a young novelist who lives on an island that doesn't have a name uh, that is sort of controlled by the Memory Police, the, the titular Memory Police. Um, who sort of revoke access to memories of certain objects and concepts and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's like sort of written as a dystopian-ish novel. Um, but for me, what I really liked about it was, I think her, um, I think Yoko Ogawa's language, um, I think she is exclusively so far translated into English by Steven Snyder. Is that his name? Um, Snyder's definitely right. Uh, yes, Steven Snyder seems to be the translator of at least both this and The Memory Police. I believe he also translated The Diving Pool, but I have not read that one, so I'm not positive. Um, I guess this, uh, Housekeeper and the Professor came out later in Japanese, but, or early, or no. Yeah, later in Japanese, but earlier in English, um, as these things happen, um, which is interesting. Um, yeah, um, her prose is really calming to me in a way that um, few things that I really enjoy are, but um, but when it hits, for me, it really, really hits. Um, I think she probably gets um, comparisons to Murakami, and I think it, she actually um, famously like debated Murakami about feminism in his books, um, which is, I read some excerpts of that, and it's, it's quite good. Um, unless I'm thinking of somebody else. I might be thinking of somebody else. Um, ooh, am I thinking of somebody else? I think I'm thinking of somebody else. Shit. Um, well, that is what it is. Um, so yeah, The Housekeeper and the Professor is a book about a young woman who is a mother of a 10-year-old. Um, she remains unnamed throughout her, um, 10-year-old gets the nickname Root, um, as in square root, um, because she is a housekeeper for a professor. Um, this professor had a traumatic brain injury, um, like a little less than two decades before the novel is set, um, which left him, um, sort of memento style, I suppose. Um, he's only able to remember the last 80 minutes, basically. Um, so every morning when she goes there, he asks her a question like, um, what is your birthday? And then he will do some maths and find an interesting thing about her birthday or her shoe size or whatever. Um, and they sort of fall into a pretty good like rhythm with each other where she is very um, understanding of, of his uh, capacities and he is like deeply um concerned with not being a burden on others in ways that are like really really smartly shown throughout the book i think um 
this is not like a overbearing professor who like uh you know is this brilliant mathematical mind he is by all accounts a brilliant mathematical mind and like they establish early on that um him and his uh, sort of caretaker who describes herself as um his sister-in-law um and a widow um a, like well i just totally lost my train of thought there um i cuz i got caught up in a thing that i'm going to spoil now um there is there's an indication um sort of later in the text that um she is not in fact a widow or or his sister-in-law she is in fact um his his wife presumably um she hires this house this unnamed housekeeper um and like stipulates that the only thing is like sh that the housekeeper has to figure shit out herself and that she the um sister-in-law does not want to be bothered um, with anything um there's it's an interesting thing right because that sort of setup might indicate a very different genre than than this is um the uh the sort of overbearing housekeeper who or the overbearing um caretaker who refuses acts or like who refuses to be implicated in anything like screams a third act thriller sort of twist thing and that's not this book even a little bit um the professor being a man who forgets constantly screams you know the possibility of a, a, a subterranean plot happening somewhere that needs to be uncovered and or like a man who's like you know deep hidden passions will come out at some point and it's not that kind of book either it's just like a really lovely tale of like a woman caring for a man who has a pretty severe disability who that makes him unable to really recognize it that but he so he has to like relearn it every day like when he wakes up he has he is like portrayed as um wearing the same like suit every day and he has post-it notes sort of clipped all over his suit um and like the most important one that comes up multiple times is like he will wake up and look and see a note that he left to himself saying you only have 80 minutes of memory um and so like you get the sense that he has to grapple with that every morning um or and then it comes up multiple times where like the housekeeper will be out on errands and she will be on for 83 minutes and then he is he reintroduces himself to her um and there's a lot of just like care and um like a lot of care among these characters and a lot of care for these characters by Yoko Gawa and also just like care about people and like the struggles that happen in life like she like i said the narrator is a mother she's a like she gave birth to her kid at 18 or yeah 18 years old and like lost contact with her own mom who had also never had a, a father figure in the house this all comes up because the professor is like deeply 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 protective of children um in a way that it seems very endearing or was very endearing to me um th then yeah and then you get another little bit just like right after you learn that um the narrator um lost touch with her mom when she got pregnant that like a few years later they reconciled um like a, the the mom gave her a gift of like a backpack and they had started to like rebuild their relationship and then her mom died of a brain hemorrhage and she was the narrator was alone again um so like root is very much a latchkey kid at the beginning and then the professor sort of in like is very adamant that he be um involved in in the housekeeping um it's i don't know I, it's like it made me feel n like nice <laughs> um it made me feel nice both in the way that yeah these that like the circles of care that range from you know the the mimetic care the care that is happening sort of on the page between characters and also the care that happens in in the sentence construction all of those things sort of reinforce each other in a, in a really 
really lovely way that made me feel like I don't want to like the word that comes to mind immediately is like contentment, but that's not it. Um, it's something like like a like a wave of like calming energy. I think just sort of like rolled throughout me multiple times throughout the book, but especially at at the end. Um, even though it's not exactly like a like a happy ever after kind of, and it's not the old H E A again genre stuff. Um, and I think that's like a, a a big positive of this book. Also, is like it 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 does that thing where it plays in genre sp spaces or with genre tropes, like the 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 repeated lot or the the amnesia, the um, the like distant caretaker who has a secret, like those things, but without like without disparaging or belittling them, without trying to deconstruct them to make the like show you how they are. Um, you know, less interesting than true literary fiction, but also without sort of um, ending up in that in in that generic space, um, because they're just not. That's just not who these characters are or the experiences they're having. Um, at the end of the day, um, yeah, there's a lot of baseball in this book, also, which um, I could take or leave um, on some level, but like. I don't know, well-used baseball stuff is is never the worst, I guess. Um, I'm thinking about a, a book that I think ended up in my top 10, I know it ended up in my top 10 pre-2020 books of 2020 um, that a coworker had me read um, called The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, a Stephen King novel. Um, uh, just a really good Stephen King book about a young girl who gets lost in a forest and like, talks to a, an apparition of Tom Gordon, the the famous baseball player, um, to sort of calm her and lead her to, or out of the woods, very literally and and metaphorically. Um, that's a good use of baseball. I don't know. Um, there's probably others that are, that are like much more obvious. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I didn't find the baseball like super interesting in this, um, but it, it does tie in with the mathematics. Um, there's, you know, the professor was like a, a big fan of baseball partially because it's one it's a game that can be sort of um seen entirely through its numbers as he puts it um you know early stats money ball type shit um yeah i guess this is like a um i feel like that's pretty much all i really want to say maybe i'll just try to flip to a random page um do, do, do. This is like a couple of like big sort of set PC things, which is interesting to say because like one of them is like her taking um, the uh, the professor to a barber shop, and like that is like the big action sequence in the first I don't know half of this book. Um, it's like very good. Um, I guess the other like action sequences are are him explaining numbers and her and math and her being wrapped by it which always worked for me which i yeah not a math person um <laughs> i do know one though um a numbers person at least i don't know how she would describe herself um what's that bit there's a bit early on when they first sort of yeah that's in the first chapter uh do 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 let's see Um, yeah, let's go. Uh, sort of in the middle of it, that's, that's fine. Um, I stopped washing and nodded, not wanting to interrupt the professor's first real attempt at conversation. Your birthday is February 20th, 220. Can I show you something? This was a prize I won for my thesis on transcendent number theory when I was at college. He took off his wristwatch and held it up for me to see. It was a stylish foreign brand, quite out of keeping with the professor's rumpled appearance. It's a wonderful prize, I said. But can you see the number engraved here? The inscription on the back of the case read President's Prize number 284. Does that mean that it was the 284th prize awarded? I suppose so, but the interesting part is the number 284 itself. Take a break from the dishes for a moment and think about these two numbers, 220 and 284. Do they mean anything to you? Pulling me by my apron strings, he sat me down at the table and produced a pencil stub from his pocket. 
On the back of an advertising insert, he wrote the two numbers separated strangely on the card. 220, 284. Well, what do you make of them? I wiped my hands on my apron, feeling awkward, as the professor looked at me expectantly. I wanted to respond, but had no idea what sort of answer would please a mathematician. To me, they were just numbers. Well, I stammered. I suppose you could say they're both three-digit numbers, and that they're fairly similar in size. For example, if I were in the meat section at the supermarket, there'd be li very little difference between a package of sausage that weighed 220 grams and one that weighed 284 grams. They're so close that I would just buy the one that was fresher. They both se or they seem pretty much the same. They're both in the 200s, and they're both even. Good! He almost shouted, shaking the leather strap of his watch. I didn't know what to say. It's important to use your intuition. You swoop down on the numbers, like a kingfisher catching the glint of, a, of sunlight on the fish's fin. He pulled up a chair, as if wanting to be closer to the numbers. The musty paper smell from the study clung to the professor. You know what a factor is, don't you? I think so. I'm sure I learned about them at some point. For 220 is divisible by 1 and by 220 itself, with nothing left over. So 1 and 220 are factors of 220. Natural numbers always have 1 and the number itself as factors. But what else can you divide it by? By 2 and 10? Exactly! So let's try writing out the factors of 220 and 284, excluding the numbers themselves, like this. 220 is 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, 11, 20, 22, 44, 55, 110, 142, 71, 4, 2, 1, which equals 284. The professor's figures, rounded and slanting slightly to one side, were surrounded by black smears where the pencil had smudged. Did you figure out all the factors in your head? I asked. I don't have to calculate them. They just come to me from the same kind of intuition you used. So then, let's move on to the next step, he, ad he said, adding symbols to the list of factors. 1 plus 2 plus 4, etc., etc. Um, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 10 plus 11 plus 20 plus 22 plus 44 plus 55 plus 110 equals 142, plus 71 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is, and then 124. Add them up, he said. Take your time. There's no hurry. He handed me the pencil, and I did the calculation in the space that was left on the advertisements. On the advertisement. His tone was kind and full of expectation, and it didn't seem as though he were testing me. On the contrary, he made me feel as though I were on an important mission, that I was the only one who could lead us out of this puzzle and find the correct answer. I checked my calculations three times to be sure I hadn't made a mistake. At some point, while, we, while we'd been talking, the sun had set and night was falling. From time to time, I heard water dripping from the dishes I had left in the sink. The professor stood close by, watching me. There, I said. I'm done. Um, 220. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 10 plus 11 plus 20 plus 22 plus 44 plus 55 plus 110 equals 284. 220 equals 142 plus 71 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, 284. That's right! The sum of the factors of 220 is 284, and the sum of the factors of 284 is 220. They're called amicable numbers, and they're extremely rare. Fermat and Descartes were only able to find one pair each. They're linked to each other by some divine scheme, and how incredible that your birthday and this number on my watch should be just a pair. Should, should be just such a pair. We stare at each other, and we, we sat staring at the advertisement for a long time. With my finger, I traced the trail of numbers from the ones the professor had written to the ones I'd added, and they all seemed to flow together, as if we'd been connecting up the constellations in the night sky. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I don't know, I find it really calming and lovely. Like I've already said here. Um... Yeah, a, a good one. A very good one, I think. Um, I'm curious if I will see... Oh, I guess I, I think this is true. I believe I found that book actually because I think it was in the same buy that I got um, Princess Body at from, or maybe Barry, Betty. Um, you know, see your earlier video. Um, I, think, I think that was the same person. I think I put them both sort of away for myself at the same time. So good 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 on me for finally getting around to him um yeah i i think i really like yoko ogawa's stuff and i think i'm gonna see if i can't find a copy of the diving pool at some point and read that because um 
yeah, like I said, there I feel like there's very when I engage with with art, I often do so not antagonistically, but like um, you know, I come out of a, a I come from de deconstruction a lot of the time. I I like to grab pieces and have them unseat the whole. I like I like a bit of um chaos in my in my art. Um and so I don't find a lot of things that I just find really um peaceful and like loving in in the way that I have found her two books about, you know, uh on a young unwed mother dealing with the or like um caring for a man who has an 80 minute memory or a dystopian novel. Um but yeah, I I yeah. Big big on it. Big on it. Good good stuff. Yoko Ga was cool. Seems seems cool. <laughs> um um cool. Uh yeah. Like that was a much longer reading than I anticipated going for. Um I hope I did at least some amount of justice to her um the rhythm cuz I think that's actually the 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 the, the thing is like there's a rhythm to her prose um, that that is that pulls you through the Stephen King reference being weirdly like not completely <laughs> um, inaccurate in some ways, in that sense at least. Um, but it, it it feels like it feels like you are walking with her through through this world and through thoughts and in a way that I can only really describe as as the rhythm of her sentences. Um, I think sentence by sentence she's really solid but st stacked together they're incredible um yes so that's that um thanks for not watching <laughs>